Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 tells us that there remains a rest for the people of God. If you look it up in your own Bibles, you will see it. Hebrews 4, verse 9 and 10. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into his rest, that is God's rest, has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. So we can clearly see here that there is a place of rest for the people of God, a place where we cease from our own works, we cease from our own striving in the flesh, and we completely rest in the Lord while he works all things on our behalf. Psalm 57 and verse 2 testifies to this fact. And this is what it says from the New King James Version. The psalmist said, I will cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. Now, the Amplified Translation says it this way. I will cry to God Most High, who performs on my behalf and rewards me who brings to pass his purposes for me and surely completes them. Wow, what a wonderful promise. God performs on my behalf, the psalmist said, and he rewards me when I enter into that place of rest. He brings to pass his purposes for me and completes them. What a wonderful place for the believer to be. A place where God works in us, a place where God works through us, bringing about His will and His purposes in our lives and in our spheres of influence and authority. It's a wonderful place to be. That place the Bible calls the rest of God. That's what Hebrews chapter 4 speaks about. The rest of God. The purpose of my teaching today is to show how to get into that place. It is to show the way to get into this blessed place of rest. And I believe that Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 is the key that unlocks the door to this rest and the map that takes us there. Let's look at it together. I know we have looked at this verse of Scripture last week as well as we taught on another subject altogether. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. Those who trust in the Lord with all their heart, and do not lean on their own understanding, have come into the place of what the Bible calls the rest of God. Hebrews 4 verse 3 says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. A very powerful verse of Scripture. We who have believed, in other words, the believer, do enter into that rest. We can also say it this way. For we who trust in the Lord with all our heart do enter that rest. We who trust in the Lord with all of our heart do enter that rest of God. So our ability to trust the Lord with all of our heart 
is by and large dependent upon knowing how to deal with our own human natural understanding which opposes and resists the wisdom of God. Perhaps I should say it this way. Trusting the Lord with all of our heart requires us to crucify, to deny, and forsake our own natural understanding. That's why intelligent people find it very difficult, or rather, not intelligent people, I should say, intellectual people, find it very difficult to trust in God because they filter everything through their own understanding. And if it doesn't make sense to them, they discard it. You see, the wisdom of God will always contradict human understanding. The reason being is that God's wisdom comes from above, whereas human natural understanding comes from beneath. And those two are extreme opposites and cannot agree on anything. In other words, they cannot coexist in the same mind. And this is what the Bible calls a double-minded person. And I'm sure you read that verse of Scripture. A double-minded person is one who has two minds, opposite minds, operating in him. And James has a lot to say about that. The book of James, he says that a double-minded person cannot receive anything from the Lord. In other words, he's like the wave of the sea, he says, that is tossed to and fro. He, he vacillates from one to the other. He's unstable. He's double-minded. And this is the place, I believe, where many believers find themselves in. It is a place that is filled with fear, a place of anxiety, a place of unrest and confusion. And I want to, um, uh, today, in other words, the people who are double-minded, they are easily shaken. One day they are up, the next day they're down. Uh, one day they're hot, the next day they're cold. Today they're full of faith, tomorrow they're full of doubt. Now, this is no way for the believer to live. There's no testimony really in that kind of living. In order to win this battle of being double-minded, we must give the Word of God the ascendancy over our natural understanding. The practical way of doing this is by transitioning from being natural to becoming spiritual in our way of thinking. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. One could say transitioning from natural human understanding to spiritual understanding. And this is a process that, of course, it takes time and effort on our behalf. It's a journey of illumination and discovery. And this is where the greatest battles are taking place in our way of thinking, in our thoughts. The Bible calls this process transformation. Transformation. We are being transformed as we embrace uh, an understanding that is spiritual, that is from above, as opposed to natural human understanding. Paul, writing to the church in Rome, says the following in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, Paul said the same thing to the church in Ephesus. He said to them in Ephesus, in Ephesians 4, 23, and be renewed 
in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So we see here a process, a transformation, as our minds are being illuminated by spiritual understanding, we begin to transition from being just natural people to becoming more and more spiritual people, where we can receive the things of the Spirit. A spiritual person does not argue with God, and he does not argue with His Word. He's not double-minded. He's not trusting in his own ability. He trusts the Lord with all of his heart, and he does not lean on his own natural human understanding. Roman, or rather Psalms 112 verse 7 describes this person perfectly. This person who is spiritual according to Psalms 112 verse 7, says he will not be afraid of evil tidings. One of the characteristics of a truly spiritual person, he has no fear. He will not allow fear dominate his way of thinking, his way of speaking, or his attitude. He will not be afraid of evil tidings. In other words, no matter what goes on around him in the world, in the circumstances that he finds himself in, he still he is not afraid. His heart is trusting in the Lord. And the psalmist goes on to say, his heart is steadfast. There's no way we can have a steadfast heart without a spiritual mind. Are you listening to me? If you want your heart to be steadfast and stable, not being moved, not being afraid, we need to obtain a spiritual mind with spiritual understanding. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established, and that's what we're talking about. An established heart has come into the blessed rest of God. And then the psalmist repeats that. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. Notice how the Word of God describes this person who is spiritual. He says his heart is steadfast, his heart is established, trusting in the Lord. I believe the reason we are having such difficulty in fully trusting the Lord is because we are still governed by and large by our natural human understanding as opposed to being governed or dominated by the mind of the Spirit. The Bible says there is the mind of the spirit and there is the mind of the flesh. Those who mind the things of the flesh, the Bible calls carnal Christians. Those who mind the things of the spirit, the Bible calls them spiritual Christians. Now, here is a wonderful thing, though. We don't have to remain carnal Christians. We don't have to... Um, stay in the state where we find ourselves in, where we are being swayed by two minds. We can become spiritual, not only by receiving the Holy Spirit, but also by renewing our minds. The renewed mind, I believe, is one of the greatest needs of the believer today. The renewed mind is our way of escaping the corruption that dominates the world of unbelievers. The Bible says so. We escape the instruments of destruction that are running unchecked in the world because we think differently. We see things from God's perspective. In other words, we see things from above rather than seeing things from beneath. 
and we reason from a place of faith and trust in the Lord. The Bible does not forbid the believer to reason. In fact, God invites us in the book of Isaiah and says, Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. We can reason. We can discuss things with the Lord. But we reason from a place of faith and from a place of trust in the Lord. An enlightened mind, for example, is the most priceless possession to obtain. Praise God. It is more precious, I believe, than fine gold or silver or any precious thing that you can imagine on this earth. And this is what Paul focuses and concentrates his prayer when he prays for the churches in his generation. If you study the prayers that Paul prayed for the church, his, his central theme or his focus when he intercedes and prays for the church is for the generation that he is talking to to pursue and obtain an enlightened mind, a mind that knows and understands God in all of his glory and in all of his splendor. Take, for instance, the prayer that Paul prayed in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. And this is a prayer that we can pray for ourselves, for our loved ones, for the church. And this is a prayer that we can pray it many, many times over because I believe it is a Holy Spirit-inspired prayer. This is how he prays in Ephesians 1 verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Let's break this down a little bit. Paul prays for the revelation of the Spirit to enlighten the eyes of our understanding so that we may come into the fullness of the knowledge of God, that we may get to know the Lord better. And then he goes on to say, that we may discover God's inheritance in us, the hope that is attached to our calling, and the greatness of his power toward us who believe. You see, as the eyes of our understanding are enlightened, we no longer lean unto our own understanding because we're receiving spiritual understanding because we begin to see everything from God's perspective rather than from a human perspective. And again, Paul continues to pray the same prayer, the same thing for the church in Colossae. This is what he prays in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Notice, he's asking for spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. He asks the Lord 
to fill the church with wisdom and spiritual understanding. You see, he, he doesn't waste his time praying for so many other things that we so often pray. Because if we come to that place where our minds are enlightened with spiritual understanding, he says that we will walk in the center of God's will. We will have everything else. We can clearly see here that there are two types of understanding. One is spiritual, and the other one is natural or carnal. One is from above, the other is from beneath. And Paul is asking God to fill the church with spiritual understanding. And then he goes on to list the benefits of this type of understanding. He says, he reveals to us that spiritual understanding enables the believer to walk worthy of the Lord and to fully please him. No one can fully please God unless he is enlightened in his way of thinking. No one can walk worthy of the Lord until he comes to a place where the eyes of his understanding are being enlightened or illuminated. It also enables us, he says, to bring forth fruit in every good work that we do, Fruit derives from having an understanding that knows God, that knows his will, that knows his purpose for our lives. And furthermore, he says, spiritual understanding will strengthen us in our inner man, making us patient and long-suffering and joyful. Wow, what a blessing. You see why I say that Obtaining a spiritual or an enlightened mind is one that should be our greatest pursuit in life. Seeing things through God's eyes empowers us to trust God with all of our heart. There's no room for doubt and there's no room for unbelief. And I believe wholeheartedly that this is a journey that every believer is encouraged to take until we reach the perfect place of trust where we find our place of rest in the Lord. It's a journey. It's a journey of faith. It's a journey of trust. The longer we live, the more we should grow in our trust and in our faith in God. If you're not growing in your trusting in God, then you're not really growing as a Christian. If you're not advancing in that area, you are backsliding. Are you listening to me? So, this journey, sooner or later, every believer needs to take. Begin the journey of enlightenment, having an understanding that is godly, that is from above, that is spiritual. Hebrews describes this perfect place of rest that waits every believer to enter it. In fact, he says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that place of rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Look at it for yourself. Look at it in your own Bible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into God's rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. You see, in that place where we rest, you see, it is an inner rest. We rest in God. We rest in His ability. We rest in His provision. We rest in His supernatural power to protect us, to provide for us, to care for us and our families. In that place of rest, which comes from fully trusting in the Lord, we're no longer anxious. Are you listening to me? There's no anxiety. We no longer fear. 
what man can do to us. We no longer stressed out because our hearts are established in the Lord. We are not troubled no matter what goes on around us. Within us, there is a place, there is a perfect rest, there is a peace that comes in us and over us, a peace that passes all understanding. And that comes through trusting in God with all of our hearts. We are not perplexed by external circumstances because our hearts are fixed on God and his promises. We no longer move by our feelings because our feelings can lie to us many times or by the opinions and the words of other people. And David, according to Psalm 27, found that place of perfect trust again and he testifies to it. He says, the Lord is my light and the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You see, if God is for you, dear believer, who can be against you? Amen. The Lord, he says, is the strength of my life. When our strength fails us, the Lord becomes the strength of our life. And then he goes on to say, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. And then he goes on to say, Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. What a testament the psalmist has. You see, David's testimony is the fact that no matter what goes on in his life, no matter what enemies he faces, he says, my heart will not fear. My heart will not be anxious. My heart will not stress. My mind is at peace. My heart is at peace. I am resting in the Lord. You see, he has found the place of complete freedom from fear, from anxiety, from worry. You see, fear causes people to worry. Fear causes people to stress, and fear imagines and expects the worst. But perfect love, the Bible says, casts out all fear from our lives. And that's the way God wants every one of his children to live, folks, free from fear. Leaning to our own understanding will give us many reasons to fear because it relies not on God, but it relies on our own human abilities. It reasons from man's point of view and tries to figure things out without God's intervention or help. How many times have we either gone to bed or sat down and our mind, was going wild on us, trying to figure a solution out. And we reason and we, and we try everything and we scheme and all of that and it comes to nothing. Why not put it in God's hands and say, Lord, I trust you. You're my provider. You're my helper. You're my strength. I ask for your help. And as we do that, as we release and surrender, that's when the Spirit of God begins to enlighten our minds and give us a way out, give us solutions that we would never have thought of in our natural understanding. Amen? You see, when Adam fell from grace, the Spirit of God and the light of God departed from him. His understanding became darkened, having no one to rely on except himself. He had to fend for himself. He had to work things out by himself without God. Because God said to him, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. In other words, he was on his own, and his darkened mind with his physical senses were the only source of help and information he had to rely on. And so is everyone who is not born of God, who does not have the Spirit of God. 
But we who are born by the Spirit of God and the Word of God, we have God's Spirit living within us. Having the light of God within us makes a difference in our life. Hallelujah. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. We are no longer natural, the Bible says, but spiritual because God's Spirit indwells us. Therefore, our trust should not be in our own natural understanding, but in God who has come to our aid, who has come to our assistance, not because we deserve it, but because Christ paid the price to bring back the presence of God, the light of God into our lives. The disobedience of Adam, the Bible says, kicked us out of the rest of God, out of the presence of God, out of the garden of God. But the obedience of Christ placed us right back into the presence and into the rest of God. Amen. So in order to remain there in that place of rest, we need to trust the Lord hourly, daily, with all of our heart, and not lean unto our own understanding. It is so simple and yet so difficult many times. We need to trust Him with our present. We need to trust Him with our future. We need to trust Him with our marriage, with our children, with our family. We need to trust Him with all of our heart, where our finances are concerned, our health is concerned, and we need to fully trust Him in every area of our lives because He is worthy, folks. He is worthy of our trust. God will never let anyone down who trusts in Him. The Bible says no one will be ashamed who puts his trust in God. That's what I want to encourage you today. Begin the journey. Seek God with all of your heart. Ask Him to give you a spiritual understanding, an enlightened mind that sees things from above, from God's perspective, rather than from the earth's perspective. He is the only source of information that is true, that is holy, that is godly. The Bible says the wisdom that is from above is pure, first of all. It is full of mercy. It is full of good fruits. But the wisdom or the understanding that is from beneath is defiled by sin and selfishness. So let's pray. Let's ask God to give us that understanding that we so desperately need. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we do not have to stay double-minded. We do not have to stay and be carnal and rely on our own natural human intelligence. Because we have intelligence from another world, from another source, from a godly source. And this is my prayer, Lord, for all of us today. I pray for my spiritual family that is scattered abroad, that you would grant us your spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, dear Heavenly Father. The eyes of our understanding may be enlightened, illuminated, so that we may know what is the hope of your calling, what the riches of the glory of your inheritance in us, and what is the exceeding greatness of your power to us or to believe. Father, Fill us with the knowledge of your will, I pray, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that we may walk worthy of you, Lord, fully pleasing you, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened by your Spirit in our inner man, unto all long-suffering and patience with joy. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.